There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switching bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this much righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand that pulls strings. It makes his little puppet dance to every song he sings. And tonight falls in on a rising tide. Look beyond the shadows. Behold a pale horse ride. Resurrect the Republic Truth Radio broadcast on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Toward the end of yesterday's court proceedings in the case of Ammon Bundy and the takeover of the Malheur National Wilderness Refuge compound, U.S. District Judge Anna J. Brown ordered Ammon's attorney, Marcus Mumford, to put on evidence quickly or rest his case. Today, Mumford gave the judge and jurors just that, in the form of direct testimony from Ammon Bundy himself. Picking up where he left off yesterday, Ammon talked about working with the sheriff in Bunkerville, Nevada, to get his family's cattle back from the Bureau of Land Management. Ammon testified that while he saw very few guns among the thousands of civilian protesters who showed up to express their support in the first five days, he did see several hundred federal agents, quote, fully armed, fully tactical, ready to fire on the American people and threatening to do so. Ammon also testified that his interactions with Sheriff Ward were cordial and that he was well received by the sheriff. Ammon said his goal was to work with Sheriff Ward in Oregon as he had worked with the sheriff in Nevada. Ammon asked Sheriff Ward to take a stand to support the Hammonds. He and co-defendant Ryan Payne met with Sheriff Ward on November 5th of 2015. He said, we were there to get the sheriff to stand for the Hammonds. That was it. I was able to see our local government in Bunkerville stand up for the people and restore the rights and protect them. Ammon later sent an email to Sheriff Ward which read in part, we respect that no two people think the same and there are many opinions of how things should be accomplished. However, when one positions himself in government, to force others to live the way that they believe, a serious line has been crossed. It is our solemn belief that multiple federal employees are using their positions in government to remove the Hammonds from the land to set a precedent for the removal of other land users. We declare that the Hammonds are not terrorists. They have not and would not hurt those around them. They are kind and generous people that love their neighbors. They have committed no crime and must not be punished further for these absurd accusations. As the county sheriff, you have taken an oath of office to defend against foreign and domestic threats. You hold the responsibility to ensure the Hammonds are protected from those that will continue to use government to force their personal beliefs upon others. Sheriff Ward testified that he believed this communication from Ammon contained an ultimatum, though he failed to identify any such ultimatum when questioned by Marcus Mumford. When it became clear that the sheriff was going to neglect his duty to protect his own constituents, Ammon felt that he had no choice but to occupy the Malheur Refuge to gain attention for the plight of the Hammon family. Ammon said that after the petition for a redress of grievances went unanswered, he asked himself, do we just go home and forget about it? We couldn't, he said. He made it clear that he believed he was following the Lord's plan in standing up for the Hammonds and going to Harney County. 
At one point, when Ammon tried to quote from the Holy Bible, the judge warned him to not read scriptures to jurors. Apparently, in Judge Brown's courtroom, it is expected that witnesses place their hands on the Bible and swear on it to tell the truth, but reading of the Bible itself is prohibited. The defense team played a video of Ammon asking people to join him in Burns, Oregon. Even as supporters began arriving in Burns, Ammon still had not decided to occupy the refuge building. When asked if they had participated in a conspiracy, Ammon responded, absolutely not. He testified that there was no plan in any way to prevent people from working at the refuge. He explained that there was no conspiracy and that it wasn't until the day of the refuge takeover itself that he first proposed the idea to others in a meeting in the back room of a cafe. Ammon explained that the refuge takeover had nothing to do with impeding bird sanctuary workers. He said, this is so much bigger than the refuge itself. The problem is not at the refuge employee level. The problem is up above. They won't listen to us and won't consider our rights. Ammon explained that the plan was to stake an adverse possession claim at the refuge, which is why the occupiers changed signs, replaced decals on refuge vehicles, and made other improvements to demonstrate their claim. After the occupation began, Ammon said he communicated at least four times with the office of U.S. Congressional Representative Greg Walden from Oregon. Ammon felt encouraged when Representative Walden gave a speech on the House floor after the occupation began. Ammon said that Representative Walden understood the issue and was articulating what Ammon felt. He said, quote, Standing on the Congress floor, I began to understand what we were doing was working. They were actually starting to listen. Here is an excerpt from that speech by Congressman Walden. I thank the Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure my colleagues are aware of the situation in Harney County, Oregon, where a group of uh, protesters uh, armed have overtaken a federal facility, the National Wildlife Refuge. They are originally there to protest the sentencing of uh, Dwight and Steve Hammond. I know the Hammonds. I've known them for probably close to 20 years. But the point I want to make at the outset here is for people in this chamber to understand what drives people to do what's happening tonight in Harney County. I've had the great honor and privilege to represent Harney County for a number of years. I have seen the impact of federal policies from the Clinton administration to the Obama administration. I have seen what happens when overzealous bureaucrats and agencies go beyond the law and clamp down on people. I have seen what courts have done. And I have seen the time for Congress to act, and then it has not. After the jury left the courtroom for their lunch break, Co-defendant Neil Wampler stood up, clapped his hands, and shouted, We all love you, Ammon. Thank you for everything you've done, as Ammon was coming down off the witness stand. Some in the public gallery also applauded. Judge Brown looked up, but said nothing to Wampler or the gallery about their expression of support. But Judge Brown did have many instances of confrontation with Ammon and his attorney throughout the proceedings. When the judge wouldn't let one of Marcus Mumford's videos be allowed, Mumford shook his hands in the air in frustration. The judge said to Mumford, stop with the theatrics, to which Marcus Mumford replied, it's not theatrics. The judge countered, yes it is. The video in question was to help demonstrate the concern that the occupiers had over the heavy-handed tactics often employed by the FBI against civilians. Ammon himself challenged the judge directly when she sustained a particular objection by the prosecution. The judge told him to be quiet. When asked about the presence of guns among the occupiers, Ammon said that without them the government would have just arrested the group and taken them away in paddy wagons, never to be heard from. What he didn't expect was for the government to drop a hammer of extreme force on the peaceful civil disobedience action and kill anyone. Ammon said that he expected the federal government to pursue trespass or eviction charges against them, but not to ambush and murder their leaders. Ammon explained that the reason they went to the refuge and did what they did 
was because of the federal government's violation of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits the federal government from owning vast tracts of land throughout the states. For example, the U.S. government claims to own over 80% of all the land in the state of Nevada. Ammon testified that he and other members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints view the U.S. Constitution as having been divinely inspired by God for the protection of the rights of the people and that it is a grievous thing for the federal government itself to abandon the constraints imposed on it by the Constitution. For ongoing updates, please subscribe to the End Times News Report at www.youtube.com slash prepare333. For the End Times News Report, this is Jake Morthonios. Jake Morthonios, he is uh, amazing. And I, I really, I have uh, nothing but uh, positive things to say about Jake and his reporting. Uh, there is so, so much more that you can learn from Jake. Uh, and tonight, folks, we are blessed again. We are truly blessed again. Uh, Laz is with us back again. Uh, Lazar Lazaro Ensenaro. Uh, try and say that 12 times fast. Uh, Laz is a dedicated patriot. This man uh, absolutely uh, has taken it under his, his, his duty to expose the corrupt nature of the federal government and, and many of the constructs that the uh, more overtly communitarian Marxist uh, takeover of our government have, have created uh, to brainwash the people. Now, uh, Laz, you are with me. Can you hear me, brother? Absolutely. There he is. All right. Now, it's my understanding that you have also uh, uh, a guest with us uh, that you wanted to bring with you tonight. Could you please do me a favor, as a contributor to RTR Truth Media, can you introduce your guest? Uh, definitely. Uh, that's Jeremy Baker. Uh, Jeremy Baker uh, uh, provi uh, provided some services for uh, Ryan Bundy as a non-licensed legalese. Uh, Jeremy Baker uh, knows uh, the law very well. Uh, I've known Jer Jeremy Baker for almost 10 years. Uh, Mr. Baker, uh, him and I resided in Alaska at one, uh, at, at one time, and we were exposing the fact of the corruption within the family courts. And if oh, anybody yeah. understands corruption within the family courts, what you're seeing here right now with the Bundys also happens in family courts. The difference between the family courts and the Bundy cases are that they're criminal matters versus civil matters. And what happens yes. behind closed doors, those, you know, uh, basically, if the walls can speak, they'll be speaking, they'll be, they'll be screaming, uh, echoing through uh, for our nation to wake up and telling the world that this de facto government that has hijacked our court system, our legislative branch, judicial branch, and le legislative branch, and executive branch, should be an epic proportion of, of, of tyranny that America needs to come down and swiftly take care of. Because if de facto, we right now de facto as state. opposed to de jour, which we have been explaining to uh, many of our listeners over the course of time, uh, I, I, I really, I, you know, the one thing that resonates with me, with, with what you have to talk about, Laz, is that you understand fully uh, truly, you understand the nature of the federal government. I want to share with you something, Laz, that's something that, that you may be, uh, it may resonate with you. Before the 14th Amendment was established, the post-Civil War Congress uh, had instituted uh, parallel predecessors, the Reconstruction Acts. Uh, one of such acts was deemed unlawful by President Andrew Johnson. Folks, President Andrew Johnson and I am going to share with you very briefly, and Laz, I want you to comment after I share this with the public. 
the power of what President Andrew Johnson said. Such a power has not been wielded by any monarch in England for more than 500 years. In all that time, no people who speak the English language have borne with servitude. It reduces the whole population of the 10 states, all persons of every color, sex, and condition. I want to repeat that of every color, sex, and condition, and every stranger within their limits to the most abject and degrading slavery. No master ever had a control so absolute over the slaves as this bill gives to the military officers over both while and colored persons, both colored persons and those of Caucasian persuasion. I come now to a question which is, if possible, still more important. Have we the power to establish and carry into execution a measure like this? I answer certainly not. If we derive our authority from the Constitution, and if we are bound by the limitations which we impose, the United States are bound to guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. Can it be pretended that this obligation is not palpably broken if we carry out a measure like this, which wipes away every vestige of Republican government in 10 states and pulls the life, property, liberty, and honor of all people in each of them under the domination of a single person clothed with unlimited authority? Here is a bill of attainder against 9 million people at once. It is based upon an accusation so vague as to be scarcely intelligible and found to be true upon no credible evidence. Not one of nine million was heard in its own defense. The representatives of the doomed parties were excluded from all participation in the trial. The conviction is to be followed by the most ignominious punishment ever inflicted on large masses of men, it disenfranchises them by hundreds of thousands and degrades them all, even those who were admitted to be guiltless from the rank of free men to the condition of slaves. President Andrew Johnson speaking on the Reconstruction Act of the 14th Amendment jurisdiction that, by the way, Ammon Bundy himself asked me to bring with me to Oregon proof that the 14th Amendment jurisdiction that the federal government empowers itself with was rescinded by an act of usurpation and fraud, and of which I brought with him from the House floor of Oregon in 1868, that resolution was actually entered into the state house and it went unchallenged for more than 50 years. Of course, now more than 100, more than 150, sir. Your thoughts? Oh, you're right. Well, I mean, to me, the 14th Amendment, as we spoke and articulated this uh, with uh, William Wagner, and I believe Jeremy was standing next to me on this, uh, yes. is null and void. Everything from yes. the, uh, the 14th Amendment all the way up to... The 26th Amendment is null and void for the simple fact of the organic 13th Amendment. Uh, title Amen. 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 Uh, yeah. That is why you, is, and I, many... you and I are joined forever in this in the, in, in this in this mission uh, with William Wagner, with many men like you who have independently and 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 separately with our own research come to the same conclusion. You know, my grandmother used to have this expression. When I used to get in trouble when I was a kid, she used to say, well, you know, if one person says you're not right, 
you might want to think about it. But if, if this person and that person and that person and this person says you're not right, you might want to consider the fact that you just may not be right. <laughs> God bless her. God bless her soul. So, uh, I have to say to you, uh, Laz, I have reviewed much of the information that you put out uh, at, at great detail. Uh, and I have to say that uh, aside from the work that you've done, the research that I have done independently from you, you and I have just recently met in the past year. Uh, we met each other briefly, and then we came together again on this show. But I have to say that the research that we have done was done independently from one another. And I have come to the same conclusions that you and William Wagner have come to. With respect to the organic 13th Amendment. Yes, sir. Respect to, right. Yes, in respect to that. And as not only that, but... Uh, the New Hampshire representative who has been castigated by many progressives. Um, uh, what is her name? I, I forget her name right off the top of my head. Uh, Trimble, Trumbull, something to that effect. Uh, she entered into her uh, the legislation of the, the representation of her state, a bill to recognize the original 13th Amendment, and it was... Uh, treasonously stricken down even though they found it upon in their vaults they found that the 13th amendment had been ratified had it it had been a part of uh their documentation for many 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 years uh this is something that the american bar association along with the british british accreditation registry the bar association in and of itself has has sought to obscure from the public. They have taken control of our court systems entirely, our juries. I, the, the one glimmer of hope that I've seen in Oregon is that regardless of Judge Anna Brown's subversion to the jury that she attempted, was that the jury saw past her attempts uh, to strangle, to, to get that stranglehold upon them. And they saw a just and righteous verdict in not guilty for all involved in the Oregon standoff. Your thoughts, sir? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of information. And I'm trying to cover as much uh, as uh, you're covering. Trying to expand uh, with respect to the organic 13th Amendment, uh, I, I I beg everybody. There's a phone number in the back of you, whoever has a pocket organic 13th Amendment. There's two phone numbers in the back where they print the actual uh, uh, Constitution. In that Constitution, when you read those two phone numbers, I beg you to call those phone numbers. They have validated that the organic 13th Amendment does exist, which is title of nobility, and that they've been working hard and pushing it. Uh, the reason why they would not, uh, cannot expand or further elaborate is because members of the American Bar Association are, are, are board members of that pocket constitution. So uh, I spoke to them. I spoke to a lady. Uh, I believe her, her name was Joanne. This is about four months ago. So uh, don't take my word for it. I, I want everybody to do their own research and be diligent. Of the, the information that, that when we put out there, uh, question it and take time to to call those numbers that I, that, I, that I'm asking you to call uh, behind the pocket constitution. So you don't have to take my word for it. You just got to call and start asking these uh, tough questions. Uh, she was kind enough to tell me that they, that the board members are aware of the kind of 13th Amendment and that they are and she validated that they are members within the board that are part of the American Bar Association. Uh, what we have to do to move this issue. Well, she basically could not further elaborate or expand uh, uh, with regard to my question. Now, with regard to the Malheur refuge, the FBI was there to assassinate our patriots. Uh, Michelle Fiore basically put out a YouTube video earlier today that articulates how they were going to massacre our patriots. How uh, Mike McConnell and, and, and some other informants 
We're oh, yes. Mitch, Mitch, Mitch McConnell and the rest of their Operation PatCon operatives. Correct. They were setting, they were setting up for an assassination attempt, which is why Anna, Anna J. Brown was adamant, adamant in releasing this discovery to appear and produce, even despite they were subpoenaed, even if they were the Freedom of Information Act. They were adamant, and I believe Jeremy Baker can even expand on this. Uh, he was he was part of the uh, Ryan uh, Ryan Bundy's uh, legal assistant uh, team, uh, and uh, and even Shauna Cox. And I was with Shauna Cox. Uh, she Anna J. Brown was a kangaroo court. She was covering up all the criminal activity by the de facto government, and and knew how this defected. And the, and the discovery would prove that they were that these people were going to be assassinated. I mean, in cold blood. Uh, I'm glad that you know. You know, we, we should be happy that, that you know, uh, that everybody everybody was able to walk for the exception of Lavoie. But uh, you had to see the mastermind. And, and FBI Prince and, and Harry Reid and Jeremy Comey should be, start be people should be ha- uh, studying a grand jury to hang these guys for treason. Hang them for treason. Prosecute them and then hang them. First, we prosecute them with regard respect to the evidence and everybody that was directly and indirectly, everybody from even Uranium One, uh, John Podesta, Budista, uh, if you want to, even uh, Loretta Lynch, Barack Hussein Obama, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, Ura- everybody member of Uranium One, uh, everybody behind Barrett Gold Inc., Calico Resource, uh, uh, everybody that was directly and indirectly, Kate Brown, uh, Jeff Merkley, Ron Wyden, Greg Bolden, Gordon Smith, uh, Stephen E. Grassy, David Ward, uh, Cliff Bench, Andy Bench, Sheriff Wolf, uh, all these people should be prosecuted in front of a common law grand jury and be hung for treason because what they perpetrated was treason. I like, and including the guy that, put that, that pulled the trigger. Uh, that, that guy needs, that definitely needs to be one of the first ones. Uh, and, and then, you know what, we'll drag George Soros from, from wherever he's at and hang him at too. So, uh, and Jerry, Jeremy Baker can expand on how they were trying to hide the discovery or how well they, uh, they prevented the discovery from coming in into the proceedings. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thanks for letting me on um, the show. I, I, I went to Oregon specifically to uh, look at the discovery um, to see what I could pull to, regarding the prosecution. When I got there, um, I noticed that there was quite a few things on the table that hadn't been asked for, and it seemed like there was a lot of things that were filed that um, didn't really um, <clears throat> seem to serve our objective. So what I did was is I came in um, and filed a couple of things. Um, I noticed right away that he wasn't allowed, Ryan Bundy wasn't allowed to have a, a rule book in the jail. Uh, they kept on blocking him the rule book, and if he couldn't have the rule book, he couldn't understand what was going on. Am I still here? All right. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Here, I want to I want to share something with you guys. Uh, I have a absolute full signal here, where I am. Uh, and for some reason, I still keep getting knocked off. How interesting! You folks, stay on the line. We're going to go to a short break. We'll be back. You Resurrect Republic to the radio broadcast on the Republic Broadcast Network. Website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. As a regular listener to Republic Broadcasting, you certainly understand the times and circumstances that we are living in. You certainly understand that the good times are over, and you certainly understand what we are heading for. Though we do not know what exactly is going to happen, we must assume that it's going to be a disaster. Are you prepared for that mess? Go to www.bugoutpanama.net and get the necessary information on our growing community of awake and prepared individuals just like you. At www.bugoutpanama.net, you will learn how we are preparing on our farm, Finca Bayano, for what is coming. Emigrate while you still can to our village where survival is of the utmost importance. Prepare, don't despair, at www.bugoutpanama.net. Hi, my name is Chris. 
Since the 1970s, I have been actively making products available that support good health. What makes my juices flow is helping mankind get healthy. Today, I'm going to tell you about a product that will help your juices to flow. I am excited to recommend Dr. Miller's Holy Tea to you. Even if we are eating a clean diet, these impurities are entering our bodies. Holy Tea moves these poisons that are creating havoc with our health out of our bowels. It works on the whole digestive system. The five tasty herbs are combined to provide an amazing detoxifying and healing tea that will rid your body of the pollutants and soothe your digestive tract, and in some cases, help you lose weight. It is critical for our health to move all of the environmental toxins from our bodies. The holy tea can do that. As a hydrocolon therapist, remember, with every BM, you're supporting RBN. www.holytea.org. 800-326-2001. You, your husband, your wife, your children, we all need food. And with dozens of food storage companies buying up airtime all over radio, it's hard for you to know which company you can actually trust. Hey folks, John Statmiller here. We at RBN understand, which is why I personally searched out a storable food company and one with similar core values to us here at RBN and, of course, you, the listener. Well, I found such a company. I'd like to introduce you to Numana Food Storage. Numana Food Storage, highly nutritious, GMO-free, contains no aspartame, no high fructose corn syrup, has no chemical preservatives or soy, and Numana Food Storage has a 25-year shelf life. To back up my claims, we've made Numana Food Storage the exclusive food sponsor of RBN. Call 888-597-0775, 888-597-0775. Order online at numanarepublic.com. That's N U M A N N A Republic.com. Food storage you'll love to eat. Without the right accessories, any guy can be off the mark. Whether you've invested thousands in your arsenal or you own a single trusted firearm, a visit to AROutfitting.com is in order. It's one of the finest online selections of tactical optics and AR parts and add ons, like EOTech, quick target acquisition with no peripheral loss. Browse the full range of Nikon scopes and binoculars. AirOutfitting.com can illuminate your world with streamlight gun mounted lights from keychain to large handhelds up to 1100 lumens. Find some stability with Battenfield tactical bipods. AirOutfitting.com has CMMG gun parts, barrels, assemblies, handguards, part kits, and more. Plus mag full clips and magazines. I know I've got you excited, so take a breath, head to AROutfitting.com. The site's super easy to navigate and features a ton of technical info, including links to manuals. We also welcome vendor and manufacturer inquiries. Remember, if you don't see it, we can get it at AROutfitting.com. Resurrectorepublic.com and click on that PayPal button. If you make a donation to the station, we will send you a few things, a few ebooks, as well as the recording that I made of that broadcast in the middle of a, well, I'm not going to mention the bikers group that I was singing that in, but hey, you know, it was cool. It was a really good time, and they were learning all about the 14th Amendment, so I'm all cool with that. Uh, folks, I had challenged, directly challenged, Judge Grasty to a debate upon uh, Ammon Bundy's interpretation upon the Constitution. And uh, Judge Grasty, of course, uh, being the coward that he was, uh, did not want 
or have any desire to debate anyone upon the subject. Now, I've given Mike a clip of what triggered me, for lack of a better term, we will use that social justice warrior term, triggered me uh, to invade Judge Grasty's safe space uh, and try and challenge him as to his interpretation upon the Constitution. Now, Harney County Judge Steve Grasty uh, did have this to say. Please, Mike, roll that clip. You, you mentioned that a lot of the people here agree with the points that the Bundys have made. Some of them. Some of them. What do you make of their interpretation of the Constitution? A guy called me yesterday and said, why aren't you enforcing this provision, the one that Bundy keeps going back to? Which one is that? Sorry. He can't even, he can't even recall. I, I can't quote it. So I, before we get done, I'll point it out to you and give you the Article what? Section numbers, what? But, clause what? Um, they, they keep saying, why aren't you doing this? There's no authority to own property, the sheriff's in charge, all those things. And I, my question to him is, are you asking me to uphold and enforce only that portion of the Constitution that you like? Or the <laughs> document. And his response is, well, that's your decision. No, it's not. You uphold all the laws of the state of Oregon, not parts Whoa. of them. And many times if you read that statute I just read, unless you read the whole thing and put it in context with the rest of it, doesn't make any sense. Oregon Live reports, and I agree with this interpretation, that the um, the reference of property ownership that Bundy's is hanging his hat on is mostly pointed at the District of Columbia, not the states. <laughs> so he has taken a piece out of context in my mind. You have to read the whole document and uphold the whole document. Do you think your, your constituents understand that well? No, whole? no, I don't. I, I mean, are there plenty that do? Yes. I got a couple of friends that are, were uh, history and civics teachers that are just livid. Do they understand it? Yeah, they taught it to many of Fellow us that communists. grew up here and went to school here. Um, and they're wondering if those people my age now that they taught, did they remember what they taught them in school? Uh, it's amazing to me. Okay, first of all, he's talking about uh, the interpretation of the Constitution and this man, as a judge, so-called, will sit here and tell you that he has to take all of the laws and statutes and codes and even refers to the Constitution as a statute. Ah! How do you argue with that? This man who cannot even refer to the U.S. Constitution as the restriction upon government, which it is, nor the section, clause, or paragraph that Ammon is referring to that specifically restricts the government to a very narrow set of parameters. This is what the Constitution is, folks. The Constitution is not an empowerment document. It is a restriction upon a necessary evil that the founders saw fit to restrain with chains. That is what it is. It, 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 it defined very specifically what the government could and could not do. And this man, in his interpretation, as a judge, so-called, would refer to the Constitution, first of all, as a statute, which just shows you the amount of ignorance that this man has, but then turns around and, and says, well, we have to employ all of the laws 
of the state of Oregon, not realizing that all of the laws of the state of Oregon have to be restricted by, controlled by, governed by the Constitution itself. How do you argue with that, is my question. Well, the problem is you can't. And we know that they're operating under ORS, which is totally unconstitutional. Uh, ORS was created by the American Bar Association, the ABA. Amen. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's also an, an operating under admiralty law or statutory law, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it's still unconstitutional. Well, you know, the Bible says something about the law of the land and the law of the sea being combined at the same time. But, you know, I, I won't I won't blow people's minds too much tonight. Uh, you know, I, I think that, that we have uh, in in very many ways ways illustrated the ignorance of these folks, uh, the takeover that they have orchestrated over the period of over 150 years. Um, you have individuals like Rachel Maddow who attack sovereign citizens. There's another thing that I want to address tonight. Sovereign citizens. First of all, it's an oxymoron. Both can't exist within the same framework. Um, however, sovereignty, let's speak to sovereignty. Sovereignty speaks of the foundational, um, tenets that the constitution lays out very specifically. And if anyone reads the declaration of independence, the constitution, we are endowed by who our creator with certain unalienable rights and among these rights i mean it's it's really rather simple it's it's not complicated and they've taken that they've secularized it democratized it earlier on the national intel report i i i quoted from karl marx and joseph stalin who made very clear what democracy led to and, and communism is its ultimate arbiter, its ultimate goal. And the 14th Amendment, and, and I have to say this, you know, my research along with a, a few people that I've worked with have all come to the same position. Uh, and I think that it was coined best, even though the, the L.B. Bork uh, you know, who derived a lot of his research from John Ainsworth, Riggs, myself, and a few others, uh, Tom Woods, uh, Ron Paul himself, who made it clear, Tom Woods, who made it clear that, that several state senators were kidnapped and forcibly uh, uh, sat to meet quorum uh, in their states. My state, the state of New Jersey, Senator John P. Stockton, who Stockton University is named after, made very clear that the 14th Amendment was forced by an act of armed usurpation and fraud. Now, this is not a southern state. This is a northern state who said this. Now, the reason that I mention this is because for the 14th Amendment to be possible, an event in history had to take place. First of all, the 13th Amendment that was passed, it was ratified absolutely and definitely. The War of 1812 that saw the British soldiers that marched into Washington and burnt down the National Archives, that burnt the White House to the ground, that burnt all of our official documents, but that left the British Patent Office. How funny. The Rothschild Army is what they did. They, they subverted the course of this union of republics and they forever altered the course by which we took. And these liberal progressive nitwits such as Rachel Maddow who takes to the airwaves spewing her poison and, and I would like to I'd like to say that uh, you know, when I went to the Bundy Ranch, I interviewed several people, and uh, 
Stuart Rhodes was there. Uh, I worked for him briefly doing some video. Uh, however, um, there was a man who who had a website called the Sipsy Sipsy Street Irregulars. Sipsy Street Irregulars. This is the man who exposed the uh, arms running the 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 Fast and Furious uh, situation. Uh, there are recordings of that at RTR Truth Media. If you go back into the dates around the Bundy Ranch, and I, you know, it, it it blows my mind that the American public have for so long been subverted, have for so long been brainwashed to believe that the Thirteenth Amendment. Never was ratified, although I have had my team, my team at RTR Truth Media, went into the Texas State Library, the Sam Houston Texas State Library and Constitutional Research Center, with a video camera and recorded in the Virginia Revised Statutes, the original 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, that made this criminal cabal of the Bar Association that has taken this union by a stranglehold and it is proved that it is an unlawful, subversive, treasonous organization. What say you, my friend? I'll let Jeremy expand on that. Uh, Go Jeremy, ahead, Jeremy. You know? Jeremy, I welcome you. Welcome, welcome you. To the show. Go ahead, Jeremy. <laughs> you want me to expand on the foreign agent esquires? Sure, please do. <clears throat> well, my research that I have done is I've exposed that um, basically we are dealing with uh, foreign agents that are um, crowned attorneys that work for Britain and they operate under statutes and codes which only are, take effect underneath martial law, and that's why the 14th Amendment originally was passed after um, March 28, 1861, when, the, uh, when Congress adjourned Sin Dai. Um, basically, it put us into a state of martial law. So all these laws that have been passed afterwards have uh, basically been passed in martial law status. So if we came out of martial law, then all these laws would be gone. That is a novel concept right there. But that's just my, what I've been researching is how to uh, kind of fix and put solutions out there for people. And from what I've understood, um, the bar has put things in a different language on purpose to manipulate the people. As long as you don't understand that language, they'll continue to do whatever they want. If you do understand the language, then they have a hard time dealing with you. I've won over 102 cases against the bar. Um, they tried multiple times to beat me um, and with people that I've worked with. Um, basically, all I've, all I've understood was um, <clears throat> what the rules are, how to write motions, and how to present these things correctly so even the judge will agree with you. And if the judge agrees with you, with you then you're playing tennis with the opposing counsel. The opposing counsel gets himself in a hard position because now he has to answer questions. Most of the time, um, what I'm seeing here is uh, sovereignty comes from competence. You have to know what you're talking about in, in order to be recognized as a king. And if you don't know, then you'll be uh, made fun of. And I've been seeing a lot of that in the courts. Um, I was previously an insurance agent, so I got a lot of terminologies, or familiar to a lot of terminologies that a lot of people don't get to see. So I got into that, and I sold a lot of death insurance. So whenever I got into selling rights to people and they're, you know, knowing what their rights are, it made it sound a little bit more appealing. And uh, I just kind of um, been understanding that once, well, this is what happened. In the very beginning, I had a court case that was kind of uh, a, kind of a, a, a framing kind of target kind of situation. But um, I had been beating the case pretty hard on certain issues. And then the um, attorney, the public pretender, he came forward and he asked me if I wanted a bar card. I didn't have to take the test or nothing. He was just going to give it to me. 
just because uh, of my understanding of the law and how I had presented myself. I told him, no, that would be treasonous because I don't work for Britain. I work for America, and I wouldn't, I'm not interested. He didn't ask me about any of that anymore. And uh, after that, I continued to uh, try to defend myself in the case, and I learned how to win. Um, I had four people that taught me in the beginning a lot of sovereignty stuff, and then I had a person that was a defective paralegal that didn't want to become a bar member, kind of take me underneath his wing and show me how to put these formulas in a um, more agreeable fashion that the court would agree with. Um, since I've been doing that, it's been very, very effective. I've been winning a lot of cases really quick, but I haven't been doing it and representing them. I've been teaching the person and opening their mind. Just teaching them that, you know, your rights are um, are there Good given to you, you by God. Good for you. As God, bless you. As, God bless you for that. <laughs> your rights come from God, and they're recognized by the Constitution. As long as I keep on telling people this to get out of the uh, constitutional rights mentality, I'm saying these are God-given rights. They can't be taken away. Constitutional is a, a contract in bankruptcy. We don't want a Constitution. We want a Declaration Amen. of Independence. Amen. And that's all we want, because that's how kings became, and that's how slaves became kings overnight, and that's what scared the king. It's going to chill down its spine, you know. So I, I think this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen is the Declaration of Independence. But my aspect of it is this. Britain has come over and hijacked the country, and it's been done through code of law, and the people are don't understand what's going on. All these statutes and codes are being forced, and they are um, not laws. They only are, have the force of law by the consent of the governed. You have to literally agree to it in order for it to be a law. This is kind of interesting trickery that they've been doing for a long time, but the people need to understand where it is. They consent to give their rights up, but the reason why they do that is because they don't understand what's going on. I would say if we want to try to save this country, we need to get more people involved in being paralegals and getting into that one percentile of the community, understanding the law, reading the rules, and, you know, not getting lawyers and beating these guys out of their positions. Um, across the country, we've had lawyers represent and get into office, and because of that, we've been dealing with a lot of issues that we wouldn't be dealing with if normal people would be winning those positions. I believe if a bar member is running for office, it's almost treasonous, I mean, for a person to vote for them because they represent Britain. But, you know, most people don't understand that. So what we need to do is we need to educate the people to understand what we're dealing with. I believe uh, what the Bible says in Luke 11:52, "Woe unto you, lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge from the people." I believe that's exactly what happened. And Amen. if we Amen. if we if we start to get people on the same page to understand that we're dealing with people that are inside of a law society that are waging war against citizens and separating them from their money and their rights, and their property. And we'll start to understand what we're fighting and dealing with. The revolution has to deal with people that have an open and educated mind to be able to deal with this stuff. And without that, I don't think we're going to be able to uh, win or get anywhere. I've seen a lot of uh, wins come on the fact that just a person tried to defend themselves. Yes. That's all. Yes. That all they just got up and said, you know what, I got the courage, I'm going to do it. And then they won. It's like, wow, that was fantastic. Mr. So Benjamin people, Franklin, what have you brought us? We have brought you a republic, if you can keep it. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I find that uh, Thomas has even said that the people have to be educated. Or if they're not, then we are in a society of people that, you know, will never... I can't, I'm massacring the quote, but... Basically, we're in a society that had never existed before because we have to be educated in order to be free. <clears throat> I agree with you on that. And, uh, you know, I, I've said for a long time, uh, just like Benjamin Franklin said, and, and this was made very clear then, uh, whether it was said in truth or whether it was said as an after fact, uh, if you don't know how to govern yourself accordingly, you're you're basically screwed. Uh, and and many of these individuals realize that from the onset, and they use that to their advantage. Uh, and and they have created over the course of many decades tax exempt foundations. They have subverted the educational system. They have uh, 
essentially built this mainstream media uh, corporate complex, this industrial media complex, to dumb down the public. And we had things happen in, over the course of time, like, you know, in World War II, when um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Frankfurt School in Frankfurt, Germany, which was the Frankfurt School of basically of Marxism, of social justice, whatever you want to call it, uh, when they had to flee Germany. And, and, and here are some of the outlying truths that are uncomfortable to the, uh, the facts that people try and discuss. And, and of course, they get smeared. Oh, you're a Nazi. No. No, I have no desire to be a part of any national socialist or any other group uh, pertaining itself to be supreme or supremacist above anyone else. But what I do have a problem with is the communist groups, uh, the Marxist groups, such as the Frankfurt School, who during World War II uh, evacuated Germany and and planted or supplanted it, its, itself in the uh, Columbia University in New York City, bringing with it all of its Marxist ideology. If you look to mainstream media today, for instance, uh, I, I watch a lot of these videos regarding social justice warriors. I, I know you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. So social justice warriors and this language that they use, political correctness is one of those uh, terminologies that, 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 is, that is brought up uh, consistently. And as I see this atheistic group online that are rising up and combating social justice warriors, I look and, and I see the root of the group that's combating it, and it's atheistic. And I sit back saying, as a student of history, oh my Lord, look at what we have, a Hegelian dialectic in the making. We have primarily online, on YouTube and, and the social media outlets, an atheistic group that is now standing up against the nihilists standing up against the social justice warriors for all the right reasons. But you notice that the one thing that they're not mentioning, they are not articulating, is the fact that their ideology is bounded and, 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 and built upon Marxism. How Absolutely. interesting that is to me, that they don't mention that. We have to go to break. We'll be right back. Resurrect the Republic Truth Radio broadcast on the Republic Broadcasting Network. We'll be right back, folks. I'm not interested in uh, photo ops. Corporate media dominates the American opinion. Finding independent voices that counter this avalanche is becoming increasingly difficult. With the endless corruption running rampant throughout our government, independent voices are needed more than ever to battle the offensive against our freedoms and liberties. As a listener of RBN, no one understands this concept better than you. Now it's up to you to do your part. The time has come for you to take action and begin broadcasting the truth to hundreds or thousands of people every month. Sound impossible? Quite the contrary. With pointed slogans from LibertyStickers.com, you can reach countless sleeping Americans unaware that they live in a real-life wonderland. LibertyStickers.com has a huge inventory of political bumper stickers and messages that reflect the truth about our government, our politicians, and the future of America. With so many in stock, there's one perfect for you. Visit us today at LibertyStickers.com. Again, that's LibertyStickers.com. Do your part. Your voice is important. Let it be heard. This is RBN, the Republic Broadcasting Network.
There was a mighty nation Blessed above all of creation It was a rare and precious pearl Conceived in faith and liberty Home of the brave, land of the free It was the envy of the world But this shining city on a hill Has turned from the creator's will And let evil take control Now the reckless men who lead them Want to strip away their freedom And to steal their very soul Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait Criticize and confiscate And let the guilty walk away In this once righteous godly nation In the halls of education They forbid a child to pray They say we need to spread the wealth They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor While the hand they hold behind their back Confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door There's an unseen hand that pulls the string It makes his little puppets dance to every song he sings As the night falls in on a rising tide Look beyond the shadows Behold a pale horse ride Listen very carefully Behold a pale horse ride That new world order is a it's a real amalgamation. Well, folks, I have with you and Mike. If you would bring up the uh, artifacts, the video, the audio clip that I supplied to you earlier, I know that all of you out there have seen a picture of the Harney County Resource Center, the sign that was replaced by the so called and I say so-called occupiers because they weren't occupying anything. Nobody was prevented from ever coming there, whether it be media, whether it be conservative, whether it be liberal, whether it be government employees. No one was prevented from coming to that location. But Ryan Bundy and I sat down one night and we talked. And he said that he wanted to develop uh, a new sign for the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. And that he was thinking about calling it the Harney County Resource Center and that he wanted, he had a certain vision in his head that he wanted to create. And he gave me that, that vision, that description of what he wanted to create. And uh, on my iPad, little cute little device uh, convenient as it was I went and I found the uh, the logo and the artwork that he felt comfortable with and I created the actual sign that, that everybody has, has seen uh, called the the Harney County Resource Center uh, it was, I'm proud to have, to, 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 to say that I created that and then I took that to Ryan and Ammon and Ryan and Ammon approved of it and they said, yeah, this is what we want to go with. We took that to the sign developer. The sign developer created it and they replaced the sign. I want you all to think about and consider if you did not tune in earlier to the National Intel Report with John Statmiller, we spoke about adverse possession. Okay? That is critical, very important to this debate, this, this trial, this, the reason why the jurors let these folks go. Adverse possession. Medenbach himself who drove uh, into town with one of the refuge's uh, trucks, and he was arrested and charged with theft. Adverse possession basically states uh, that when the federal government essentially uh, it, it operates outside its boundaries, that the people 
when they step in and they right the government's wrongs, they are the arbiters, they are the owners, they are the possessors of said property. Medenbach was found not guilty and he had one of the refuges trucks in his possession in town and was charged with theft, adverse possession. This case, I don't even know how this is going to be used in the future. Uh, this is going to peel back a can of worms like I can't tell you. Uh, but one of the clips I want to share with you tonight is uh, uh, I, was, I was put with David Fry, who was working directly for Lavoy Finicum as his main right-hand man in media matters. And I, when I say media matters, I don't mean the liberal group media matters. I mean, Lavoie's media issues matters uh, uh, assignment. And, and David Fry, who is one of the nicest men that I've ever met in my life, he is uh, one of the most intelligent and his his bloodline goes back on, on not only into the Japanese samurai, but to the American Republic. Uh, he's directly related to George Washington. A lot of people don't know that about David Fry. David Fry is an amazing individual. Anyway, Lavoie came to me one afternoon and he put me with David Fry. And they put us in a building that was David Fry, myself, and Shauna Cox in the same building. Well, just because I'm curious and I'm an investigative reporter, I went into the basement of this building. And I discovered, to my dismay, uh, a, a bunch of artifacts. And these artifacts were found in a condition that were far uh, not explainable to be considered evidence because they were really in, in saddest state of affairs. They were, uh, they had rodents nests in them and they were uh, put right next to a hot water heater that looked like it was on its last leg. Anyway, Mike, if you would bring up the, uh, the Malheur Native American artifacts desecration video and please roll that clip. Hey guys, what's up, Blaine Cooper? I'm here with Lavoy Finnicum, and what are we doing, Lavoy? Okay, what what it is, Blaine, is that uh, we we are concerned about the way artifacts have been stored here, the Paiute artifacts, and so we're reaching out to the Paiute tribe to say we need to open up a uh, um, some communication, we're looking for a liaison, because we want to make sure that these things are returned to the rightful owners and that they're taken care of. So Now, from what I understand, these are their artifacts? These are some of the artifacts. We want, we want here, if you step back, I want to show you how we found these things stored here. So you can see there's boxes of artifacts here. You can see there's some rat's nest in here. This is the way we found it. Yeah. And you see you see there's grinding stones, different things here. It's projectile points. So yeah. uh, the way I understand points. it, that the BLM or whoever was in charge of these the the na native artifacts just kind of boxed them up and let them just rot down here. Yes, and, and for example, let's see, do we have any dates on these things? Yes, we do, what, sir. What's uh, the date on this one here? This one is an 89, I believe. Okay, 1989. So, so we have these artifacts from 89, 99, 2020 some odd years they've just been sitting down here so my question is is why do they just keep them down here yeah don't they, they, don't they, they, they belong to the natives yeah to well, the rightful owners why are they locked away here for nobody but for them to look at whenever they come down here this needs to be taken care of and so we're reaching out to to the Paiute people um, in in as sincere manner as I can Please let's open up a dialogue. Come um, get a representative. Come come here and let's start talking face to face, and and let's let's make sure that we we take care of the heritage of the of the the Native American people, and uh, and any concerns that they may have, so that they can voice them, so that we can uh, we can hear that any claims that they they may have upon the lands. Let's let's begin that dialogue. So, but like I said, this is just some of them here. If you'll come over here, over here you will see. 
you will see other boxes. Just this is the way we, we found it. Oh, sir, I believe this is evidence. And that's why I didn't, I didn't touch anything. But these are our U.S. Department of Interior projectile points from uh, 19. 80? 1980. So they're sitting here from 1980, just sitting in the top of the boxes like this. This is this is how the the Native Americans heritage is being treated. To me, I don't think it's acceptable. Let's get this thing cleared up and let's start uh, um, having this dialogue. So again, um, just starting this dialogue and and we we want to to be respectful as possible of of everybody. So thanks. That's. What I just want to show you. So, yeah, guys, so get this All right, that's around. good, that's good. Right, get it up so, there. you get the idea here now. Uh, one of the things that we were hearing in the mainstream media uh, last was that, um, that the Patriots were, uh, they were damaging and they were, they were stealing and they were uh, desecrating the native artifacts uh, at Malhur and all the while, this is what was going on. While we were hearing, we were inside the refuge, and we were hearing uh, the mainstream media is accusing you of desecrating the artifacts. All the while, we felt like we were losing our minds because at the very same time that we were receiving all of these accusations, we were literally and physically reaching out to the Paiutes and saying, here are your artifacts. Please come and secure them in, in whatever ceremony or whatever uh, in whatever way that you deem fit. Please come and secure these artifacts because they were literally stored next to a hot water heater that had probably been 20 years old, was about on its way out. And if that hot water heater had burst, all of those artifacts would have been drenched and all of the records that that were kept with them would have been destroyed yet lavoy was trying so desperately to reach out to the paiutes and what we were finding was that the paiute leadership was being manipulated by a group who was very marxist in its nature and siding with the federal government, the same federal government, by the way, the same union that they have complained about all these years for uh, oppressing them, they are now siding with and protecting. And what we come to find out was the officials that were involved in that were all puppets. There's no big secret there. But uh, Laz, I, I, I want you to Tell me what you think about what you just heard and the, the, the evidence and the information that we've just provided for you. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. And, and I want to break it down so uh, we can take it over back to Jeremy. But uh, I want to break it down into yes, yes, four yes. categories. Uh, the first one we're going to have to ask ourselves is, were the Paiutes threatened? And... Within the, within the ranks of the Paiutes, do they have traders like what's happening in North Dakota with the pipeline? No different than the traders that we had informants uh, within the Bundys. So we have traders, yes. uh, natives, or were they threatened? That's the first question that we have to ask ourselves. And then come to the conclusion that could probably be the combination of both. Uh, yes. With respect with respect to the next follow-up question, is the Malheur Reg, uh, Refuge federal or state? Now, again, we'll go to <laughs> Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, that the federal government cannot own any land within the, within, within, within the state. But on top of it, it has been reaffirmed by Arizona versus California, Supreme Court, uh, federal Supreme Court ruling, that the federal government cannot own any land, no waters. So what the hell are they doing? And if they have zero jurisdiction under the Constitution and zero, zero jurisdiction versus Arizona and California, the Supreme Court ruling, then why in the hell are patriots being prosecuted in a federal de facto court room? But that's and, the assassinated. Word, de facto. and assassinated. And assassinated. Correct. Now, the next question to you is, well, you know, there was a contract. There was a contract on August 17, 1998. 
August 17, 1998. I have to reiterate. And it was, and it was from the, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or the uh, FWS, in agreement, that agreement number, and I'll give it to you, it's 135708J as in Jesus, 187. And that's in, it's under the title, Cooperative Agreement Between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Great Basin Society. Well, who is the Great Basin Society? Uh, it's, uh, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a society. It's a society as in a regional environmental education and research center, which goes hand in hand with the Lewis and Clark Law School, which is a Lewis and Clark Law School. Now, they gave this. So if the state gave this agreement, all right, to the U.S. and Fish and Wildlife, to the Society as a Regional Environmental Education and Research Center, they have, the federal government has zero jurisdiction because that land belongs to the state. It's the state making an agreement yes. with, with the society, not the federal government. Now, why is this, why is this contract so vital? because it demonstrates that the federal government has zero jurisdiction. Now, now the next, the next argument that we're going to have to bring up is the evidence. And we have to understand who appointed corrupt Anna J. Brown as a federal judge. We have to say, where did school did she graduate from? Could it be from the Lewis and Clark show? The Lewis Go, and Clark Law School. Now, Go, did Lass. Bill Clinton make a contract with Russia when Bill Clinton was president. And I tell you, yes. And if you want to question me, then that's fine. But go back when Bill Clinton was president and find the executive order. And on top of that executive order, when he made an appointment of Anna J. Brown to be a federal judge, don't you think she needs to give Bill Clinton and his wife and the Hillary Clinton Foundation a, a deal that they can never resist? Like Uranium One and the cover up of the Malheur Refuge and the cover up oh. of Jeff Merkley, Ron Wyden, Cliff Bent, Stephen E. Grassi, David Ward, Kate Brown, and by the way, four of them have been appointed in their respective positions. So, appointed, you not elected, not elected folks, appointed, big difference. And, and guess what? All in these documents from 1998 also refers back to the back to the Hammond, because we're talking about the Malheur Refuge and anything within that basin, within within the Harney Lake, Mud Lake, and uh, Malheur Lake. All those are minerals, and you got to understand that you go back to 1978, August the 15th of 1978, where they where the Diamond Crater, where there was abundance of diamonds found there, not by me, by a geologist back in 1870. And now we're up to date. And why haven't those minerals been extracted? Because back in 1978, for some reason, they knew that we're there, but they did not proceed to go ahead and extract those diamonds, including just the uranium, copper, aluminum, magnesium, and, uh, and uranium. Now, here we are today. Anna J. Brown prevents Jer 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 Jeremy Baker, uh, Julie Emery, Roberts and everybody with and Shauna Cox and everybody else with defense from bringing this discovery with respect to the if it, if it belongs to the state or it belongs to the federal. And Jeremy can expand on how many loops they had to jump, how many hurdles they had to jump, and still got nowhere because of corrupt Anna J. Brown tactics. You want to expand that, Jeremy? Go, Jeremy, go. Particularly time that we had requested on jurisdiction, it was denied, except for one issue. Um, we had some documents given that showed ownership of the Malheur, but the ownership documents that they had given were clouded. And basically, um, major discrepancies were involved. So what we've noticed is in order for um, the Malheur to actually be the federal government, the, the people had to offer it, and then there had to be an acceptance by the Congress. That has never happened. So the Malheur still belongs to the state. Yes, what we I agree. Uncovered. But the aspect of it, can we get that in court going on? The federal government doesn't want to talk about it. They kept on blocking us over and over and over and over <laughs> every time we put the subject up. 
But I will sure. say this. Anytime we did hit him with anything, it seemed like Anna had been prepared to deny anything that was requested. She would always come up with some kind of frivolous response, like it's untimely or it's moot or we're not talking about that. And the reality of it was is these are vital issues. When you're challenging jurisdiction, like jurisdiction is the thing about authority comes from ownership. And if they don't own the property, then what authority did they have to prosecute? And that was the whole question. <laughs> and they didn't even want to talk about that. So, you know, you could see that they want to keep that away from the jury 100%. But what yeah, I did notice but, was... But the verdict, the verdict with adverse possession kind of uh, decreed that uh, their position was, in fact, moot. Was, in fact, what? Moot. It, moot. Was, uh, uh, it was not valid. Yeah. Their, their uh, position on um, how they responded to the jurisdictional claims were was totally, theirs were ridiculous. And, and it's only fashion that I couldn't even agree with. I was just, I could not believe that we would bring up the jurisdictional issue and then the judge would ignore it bold face. It was like as if she was like completely in the pocket of the prosecutor. I, I, I dealt with a lot of judges and, but this one specifically just seemed like she was doing whatever the prosecution said. Um, because of that, she opened herself up to a lot of different things. I, I started filing discovery requests like, who are the informants? Let's have a uh, conspiracy hearing instead of going to trial. Um, <clears throat> let's have, uh, let me get all this discovery. And there was a pallet, there was a picture of a pallet that was given to me that had 259 million documents on it. I was like, what the heck is that? And they were like, oh, that's the discovery in this case. I was like, that's the discovery? It looks like a m most immaterial, frivolous pile of paperwork I've ever seen. Who who's received that? And they were like, um, nobody has. I was like, well, then how can the government say that they have disclosed all evidence? And, well, they kept on saying it on record. It seemed like they were perjuring themselves from what I saw. But um, <laughs> it, it just continued to go on and go on and go on. Um, so she asked me in detail, what did I want? And I said, well, I wanted the statements of the co-defendants, the co-conspirators, and here's you know, a memorandum of points and authorities to back it. I want all the uh, preservation of the tapes and the notes. And I want the inspection of the grand jury proceedings and um, the production of the Jenks material. And they didn't like any of that. Um, it was like they wanted to deny it, but what they no. did was noticed was this, is they did deny it at first, but I, I was talking to Ryan Bundy on the phone, and I told him, you know, this is really awesome, man. I can't even believe that the judge is just retarded. She has just denied every motion that's going to help you win your appeal. And he was like, what? And then the next morning, she had reversed her decision and basically said that the government had to respond to these documents. I was like, oh, nice. That's the only thing that, that, that they had to do. Um, and the only time I've seen them respond like that, or the judge respond like that, um, according to most of the things that were filed underneath Ryan Bundy. Um, but after that, um, what I saw was is the, um, the judge got our response but that she didn't even read it. She just, like, basically just ruled in favor of him. But what happened was that she had left herself on the table so bad, the case was over. Ryan and the Bundys had won at that moment because they had basically violated U.S. versus Brady, or Maryland versus Brady, and uh, it, it made it so it was going to be an easy appeal to win. So I was thinking that after the jury went into uh, deliberations, that they didn't come in the next day at noon, that we had an argument in there, and that we won. And I, I really I really felt that way. So I just felt, you know what, it's time to step away from all this and get out of Oregon and let these guys win. And uh, that's what we did. I um, Specifically, when I first got to Ryan Bundy, I realized that this man would say anything that I gave him to say. So what I decided to do is to teach him their language. I taught him how to move the court. I taught him how to object. I gave him checklists and according to do all this stuff. So he just fired off as whatever needed to be said. Um, I told him that he had to do it in order to retain his, uh, his win and to basically strike all, any evidence that came in that was frivolous or hearsay testimony or witness. I mean, basically just try to impeach the witnesses the best he could.
Um, I believe he had a lot of fun doing that. And I also moved to disqualify the judge because she tried to deny all of his discovery requests, and that's a due process violation. So I was like, no, you can't do that. But anyway, she decided to change her decision on the ruling. That's when everything came into effect to where Ryan Bundy had the ball in his hand and the government didn't know what to do for two weeks. It's a pretty interesting little situation. Um, but if you can, you can go into uh, the dockets and you could read some of the stuff that was said and responded to. Um, it was kind of a little war we had on the record. It was kind of funny because when it got done, you could see that there was so much left on the table that the government was basically didn't want to talk about and that were getting cornered by. So when you got them there, you were just waiting to see what was going to happen. So what it came down to was I had to tell Ryan Bundy how to break the conspiracy argument. I looked at it from this perspective. I said, Ryan, do they have any video uh, or any evidence of you intimidating, <clears throat> threatening, or... Um, or intimidating or using deadly force on any of these people to impede them. He said, no. And I said, okay, well, the problem is here. I have an indictment that says November 26th to January 26th, and it doesn't have a day in which you were doing any of this stuff. I don't have an agent or any, any kind of officer that's doing this. So what I'm going to say is, is this. If there is no day and there is no agent, and it's so vague like this, it never happened. There was no conspiracy. And then after that, I kind of got him out of the uh, being scared of this and just attack it full on. So he, um, and, and as you see, what the end result was, 26 acquittals. So that's where we stand right now, I guess, uh, with respect to what's going to happen now in Nevada because uh, we can use the same tactics in Nevada that we used over here in, uh, at the Mount Hill Refuge or, or here in Oregon. Um, I, I get the, be- the, the biggest thing, next question we should, have, we should be asking is, all these uh, federal agents that committed conspiracy to commit fraud upon the court, uh, charges need to be brought up for aiding and abetting, uh, perjury, obstruction of justice. Um, well, wrongful death claim. Handling prosecution, wrong, yeah, wrongful death, uh, you know, uh, illegal imprisonment. Correct. Yeah. Conspiracy to commit There's murder. A, conspiracy against rights. Deprivation yeah. of rights Deprivation under color of, of law. There's a lot yeah. of this stuff that's been going on, but we, what we got to do is we got to get this case won, and we got to get uh, in Nevada and get these guys out of trouble. Then we can move to start prosecuting these people. We have to get through their immunity, and that's the main thing. If we get through their immunity, then there is no... I mean, all we have to do is show that they did, their authority is this, and they went outside their authority. Once we've got that, then it's showtime. Amen. This is the most transparent administration in history. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. While the large majority of Americans have never heard of cryptocurrency, it is the medium of exchange of the future that has already begun. On the other hand, the large majority of RBN listeners are very aware of the corruption within the Fed and the trillions in counterfeit money and credit it has created. Well, would you like to do something about this? OneCoin, the fastest growing company of any kind in world history, will pay you to help do away with the Federal Reserve. Henry Ford didn't invent the automobile, but he surely developed many great improvements in the industry. In 1927, talking pictures made silent movies obsolete overnight, and email has practically done away with the need for a fax machine. With cryptocurrency, Bitcoin became the pioneer in 2009. But now OneCoin, as the first ever gold-backed cryptocurrency, has moved to the top of the industry in only two years, and its impact on the financial world could be devastating to the Fed. Bill Gates and Richard Branson and all the jillionaires are already acknowledging that this system of paying for goods and services is becoming what will be recognized as the new worldwide reserve currency. For more information, call Pat Shannon at 601-212-0911. Again, that's Pat Shannon at 601-212-0911. 
Do you have difficulty taking supplements? Are you searching for a high-quality, complete nutritional drink that your whole family will love? Nutramedical's Life Support has arrived. All of your daily nutritional requirements in one quick, delicious drink. Dr. Bill Deagle's Life Support is a proprietary blend of vegan protein, activated vitamins, essential minerals, amino acids, probiotics, green tea, digestive enzymes, anti-inflammatories, cancer prevention, detoxification, and much more. Your body will high-five you for this one. Life Support is the best complete nutrition meal replacement on the market. Whether you are an elite athlete, have post-operative challenges, chronic illness, elderly, or a family that just wants a quick, delicious drink, try Dr. Bill Deagle's Life Support for optimized nutrition in one great tasting smoothie. Just add cold water, almond milk, fruit, or anything else you like. Nutramedical's Life Support. Try our great tasting chocolate or vanilla today. Call 888-212-8871 or visit us online at Nutramedical.com. Nutramedical.com for the whole family. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. If your home has hard water, then it's likely that LimeScale is clogging your pipes, damaging your appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars each year. You can eliminate LimeScale in the entire house with HydroCare products available at Wave Home Solutions. Easy and efficient with no maintenance, no salts, no chemicals, and no coils. And you can buy with confidence from Wave Home Solutions. Performance guaranteed. Just go to bestwater411.com. That's bestwater411.com. Homeowners, are you in foreclosure, expecting to be served with a foreclosure lawsuit, or suspect your lender has coerced you into an illegal mortgage transaction? A huge number of mortgages made in the last 10 years have legal issues and are possibly defective. State laws and the U.S. Supreme Court have upheld that defective mortgage documents are grounds for foreclosure defense and for counterclaims in favor of the homeowner. If your mortgage has been sold or assigned since closing the loan, it may be defective and you may be paying the wrong party and the lender may not have standing or the right to foreclose or collect payments under the law. If you would like to know if your mortgage is legal or not or know if you are paying the right party, we can help. Our initial consultations are free of charge. We are not attorneys. We are legal researchers and work closely with experienced lawyers who know how to help you find the evidence to help you keep your home. Call toll-free 1-855-2-KEEP-IT. That's 1-855-2-KEEP-IT today. Welcome back to Resurrect, the Republic Truth Media Broadcast on RBN. Uh, Lazaro, Ensenaro, and Patrick Baker, is that correct, Patrick? Jeremy Baker. Yeah, if y'all could continue. We lost Tom, and I'm unable to reconnect. I'm sorry about that, but if y'all want to just carry on. Just Chris. Oh, yeah, Chris. Go ahead, jump in there. Hey, Lazaro and Jeremy. 
Uh, I am in Las Vegas. I'm an experienced court watcher. I understand the schemes and tricks of the court. Uh, we got to talk, brother, and I think I might be able to provide you some accommodations when you come to town, if you're coming, to aid in the Bundy's assistance here, and I can probably shoot you some help a little, offer a little. In fact, I know these judges here violating Smith Act, Grand Lanham Act, Taft-Hartley Act, Sherman Antitrust Act, seditious conspiracy undermine the government of the United States of America, warring against the Constitution, and they are definitely uh, in high treason. Well, uh, sounds like a guy with my work has me. Um, I would love to be there. Uh, all I have to do is, uh, I just have to show up, basically. Um, I need, um, I would need to basically fire off the discoveries, but what I'm hearing is, is uh, you guys have had, or they've, they've blocked um, any pretrial motions from being filed, so I'd have to get in there right away to start opening no. that stuff up, back up. What you're dealing with here in Las Vegas is Gloria Ann Navarro is a Harry Reid appointee as the Chief Justice. You have a multitude of different judges below her that she's holding leverage over and making them kowtow. I've seen them reverse positions. I've seen them deem the court to be a de jure court when we know, in fact, the U.S. District Courts are foreign law courts. They um, are operating star chamber courts. I've had them rule against me. Uh, in Camara, Star Chamber, uh, no discovery whatsoever, uh, 12B6 dismissal my complaint claiming it's frivolous and nonsensical and all that other crap they throw at you when they tell you when they F you off and uh, pound sand, uh, judicially speaking, abusing their discretion, aiding and abetting the prosecution, they're taking bribes from the banks. Uh, it's about every type of corruption you could ever want to find here in Las Vegas. Uh, there was a write-up in the San Francisco Examiner paper uh, addressing these same things. And we had a case here called Operation Greylord in which Harry Claiborne, a local judge, got caught up in the Chicago mob. They have a lot of influence here in Las Vegas, too. And he got uh, disbarred. Hmm. Sounds like um, a lot of work. I, I, I would... You have to expose the fact that this stuff is going on. If you've got any evidence of it, you can basically put this stuff in underneath an affidavit and let it hit the public record. You just have to prove it. It's all about what you can prove. And you can put this on with affidavits and all this stuff and any kind of record um, in the court of law. It just has to be filed correctly. Um, well, here's some people in the Horse and Pony the Show. With the Horse and Pony Show, you have to come in um, as professional as possible, put the stuff on the record, and then challenge the ruling of the judge. It has to be uh, whenever they rule frivolously. You have to say oh. there's a statement that can be said is, is I take exception to your remarks and assign them as error. Can you give me the legal points for that determination, please? We've got a lot we can talk about, but I can assure you I've run right across the most corrupt, obstructive. They are apparently using – I ran across this by doing a lot of due diligence – they held what was called the Sedona Conference back in 2004 down in Sedona, Arizona, for the Western Region judges. And in that particular conference, they talked about international Internet searchable data, uh, technical assisted review, which is really preview, where they do a, do a bullion data search uh, to data mine, to determine pre, uh, pre-case hearing, and if they find any evidence in your writing style that reveals you to be a non-bar litigator, such as myself, um, and I've got them dead right on the facts, law, and evidence, but they selectively cherry-pick and find little technical defects in your petitions or pleadings they can amplify to dismiss your complaint, and they subjectively, interpretively overlook the critical, uh, un- irrefutable, provable matters that you've presented in your paperwork. Uh, I mean, it is the most corrupt bunch I've ever seen in my whole life, brother. And I've been in the law enforcement business quite a bit. Well, I mean, you got to understand, the judiciary system has completely been corrupted, and it's it's kind of like the theme with every state. So you have to understand, uh, you got to beat them on the record. It's all, it matters what is seen. That's why they try to cover the record as much as possible, to make it so you, you, what isn't seen, and try to strike this from the record or take it from the record. But tampering with the, with the record is also... Um, it's, tampering with evidence because most of the time they're taking evidence off the record. So 
So you can get them for tampering it with evidence, cause new ch charges and all that. What we need is a team of people that know how to um, operate um, in, in the law. And if we were able to do that, we'd probably get a lot farther because the bar members are basically running in this other language and they've been taking advantage of the people so bad because they don't understand what's going on. And as long as that's going on, it's just like uh, playing a video game with one controller. Oh, I, I totally agree with you, Jeremy. I read this stuff. I read between the lines. I understand the doctrine of emperor. I know what they are, their little target words and tri uh, red flag words they put in, like special or other or so on and so forth, whenever they want to make it uh, murky and quirky, and they can basically subjectively interpret it to anything they want to twist it to and make it, uh, uh, they call it proportionally biased, and they uh, put their elbow on the th scales of justice and deny you all. I never even had a hearing. I never had an adversarial confrontation. I never had a 26F uh, ability to get evidence from the guys. These guys are criminals here. They're absolutely running the Star Chamber Court. And did you get blocked by immunity? Is that what happened? Oh, man. <laughs> Everything in the world. I had a, a 26F conference, and I got served on a Thursday. I was supposed to be there on Monday. I was sick as a dog, running fever and sweats for a couple of days. But I did get a motion to extend expand time and cited uh, with particularity the reasons. And uh, I showed up. I objected to the uh, magistrate hearing because I know it's just an attorney with a black robe on. And I would never expect, uh, accept an AO85 uh, magistrate. I'm on an Article Three General Justice. But we know there is no Article Three General Justice courts left in America except for maybe a couple of the courts of appeals or maybe the uh, Court of Claims or a couple of other specialty courts where it may still exist. But this foreign law that seeped in and usurpated the law of the land of America is so despotic and tyrannical, it gives these judges the discretion to do any damn thing they want to, and they do do. To, to an extent, they do. Yeah. Um, did you have an affidavit uh, connected to your complaint? Because you sound like you had a oh, I always in motion passed. Absolutely, I always incorporate affidavits of status, affidavits in, to support each one. I, I created what I call a mini affidavit, uh, putting in the minimal particulars to attest to the authenticity, credibility, and uh, in the honesty of the documents that I put in, the claims that I made in the thing, as a matter of. Uh, procedure for myself because I understand that every petition or pleading is, or motion is supposed to be accompanied with an affidavit to determine it to uh, uh, guarantee its efficacy. Yeah, to make it so it's better understood. Sure. But, you know, whenever the judges are aiding and abetting the other side, be it defense or offense, it doesn't make any difference. In fact, Justice John Paul Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, gave an edict to the uh, district courts of the land to get down off the benches, evade their, uh, abandon their lawful uh, neutral adjudicator positions to get in the game, pitch or hit for whichever side has the best interest of the bar or their own personal interest, uh, and um, do whatever they think needs to be done in order to line their own pockets or to advance the bar's interest. No, I understand. I've, I've noticed that uh, the best way to get the uh, judge to rule in your favor um, is to basically make it so they don't ha they have anything to rule on because um, they only rule on controversies. So if you give it something that they don't have to rule on and you get the, the uh, prosecution to, it, to agree because you corner them, then basically um, you get rulings in your favor because the prosecution well, agrees. Yeah, I wish I had a team like you guys, but I'm just me by myself. My wife left me June the 17th, and uh, it hasn't been easy to keep on fighting without uh, any assistance from anybody. But I get de minimis, and, uh, you know, I, I understand the law very well. I write pretty well, and I can give you citations. I can argue the case from the floor. I share all the knowledge that I have with everybody freely, but I don't get much coming. I get a little bit coming my way. I have to say that, and I appreciate that from some people, but... Uh, um, you guys, I, I know an awful lot about this Bundy and the Malaher case and the Lavoie Finnegan aspects. I was at his funeral, and I was out at the uh, area. And Tom actually stayed at my house for a little while uh, prior to his going out to the Bundy site and after he got through. And, sure uh, did. So I, I, I'm a former law enforcement professional from several different jurisdictions, including the 546 military police attached to CID, 
Walnut Mill, Oklahoma PD, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and Nevada State Gaming Control Board Enforcement Division. So you'd think I'd get a little credibility, a little uh, professional courtesy from the judges, but I get out, I've been targeted. I know they have a secret hit list. And I made some excoriating proclamations on the county board of commissioners down here, and I indicted the, the bar itself for the same cases I cited before, the Smith Act and Van Lam and Taft Hartley Act, or monopoly violations. This is a right to work state. And when I did that, apparently I incurred the wrath. And of course, I know that they monitor all, everything outside the pleadings on your internet data profile. They go outside and they search that without a warrant. Well, that might be okay for 14th Amendment subject slave search citizens, but I've got affidavits of status that set me apart as a state national American uh, non citizen. Um, and so on and so forth that I've included with all my petitions and pleadings to give them notice, but they uh, are curiously or uh, subjectively, interpretably blind, cognitive and dissonant, or willfully ignorant, or incapable by their bar bias of reading my complaints, so they just rule them to be frivolous and nonsensical. How are you presenting these motions? I mean, I mean, usually when you're presenting the motions, you make it into per, you put it in a present, presentation, and which is so agreeable that they cannot do anything about it. That's that's, that's just my experience of how I've, I've gotten a lot of wins is making it so it's you you have to sell it to the judge, and when you sell it to the judge, the prosecution looks over there like, uh oh, I'm in trouble, and then now they have to answer the question. Well, you know, and I, I understand the concept of challenging jurisdiction to the opposing party, not to the court. And uh, as you mentioned before, I am going to challenge the jurisdiction authority because I did put in a non-consent to magistrate attendance in this particular matter because uh, I understand the complexities and the bias of the bar. Of course, the judges are all bar uh, agents also now that they've uh, made that a requisite to be a judge. Yeah, well, real I, nice of them, huh? That's not the case in all situations, but yes, that is that is true in a, in a, in a majority of them, yes. I have met a couple of them that were not uh, lawyers prior, and because of that, they were real um, coherent to, you know, God-given rights and all that kind of stuff. But if they've been trained in procedure, it seems like they just do not listen to that. Well, I have a copy of the judge's bench book, and I can tell you I have a form that requires bar association to be considered for a district court or a Supreme Court appointment. Mm. See, and that's the problem. They're all being appointed, and we have to understand, like, uh, like Stewart stated, they're all appointed, titled nobility. We have lost our way. They, they basically have, have infiltrated the entire system. And uh, you're, we, 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 you you're know really what? Start muffled there, Lazaro. Start following within your motion. Use as exhibits. Uh, what do you call it? The 13th Amendment uh, of title with respect to title of nobility and challenge them and how they got there, where where, where they're appointed. Now we know that they were appointed, but you have them answer the question. And uh, and I can resend those uh, actual copies of the 13th Amendment titled nobility. I was given by William Wagner. Uh, uh, which Stewart knows good. William Wagner, so he can validate the, good the, man, the evidence. Good man, good man. I think he, I couldn't I quite make he, out that last name. He said, you're real muffled up right now, Lazaro. I know everybody wants to hear what you're saying, but you've got such a quiet tone. No, I can, I'm having I can, hear, him. I can hear him pretty well. Uh, William Wagner is a man who, okay. uh, uh, who has been uh, uh, assailing this 13th Amendment for many years. Uh, he's an incredible man. It, along with uh, Dodge, uh, he has he has been for many years. Many people that have been researchers in this area have uh, have have come across William Wagner's material. Uh, he's been steadily on this for a long time. Well, what I do, I'm you saying, make a copy. We give you a copy, and then you submit that copy as evidence. No, but but we know that they're appointed, but we have them answer the question if they're appointed. You know, one thing is a demand, the other one's a question. So we're just, we're going to ask them the question, and then bring that as as evidence, and you know, as exhibit one, two, and three. Because right now, 
uh, uh, from the, the, what I have and from what William Wagner has, and he has provided to me, they're certified, meaning by, they're certified by a, by, a, by a notary and a signature of the governors of each state, which is Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Now, um, my understanding is that, Stuart, you guys came across uh, the organic 13th Amendment in Texas. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. If you don't mind my suggesting, there's a case that's very closely to the Bundy case and the Malahir case uh, called the um, oh, Midnight Fire case over in California with PG&E where the Forest Service were starting fires and blaming it on ranchers to steal their land. And they had to recuse all the judges in the Northern District of California because of the uh, corruption that. over there. Oh, wow. Well, on top of it, but see, and, 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 and I advise, if possible, I'd like to reach out to this family because under the 1997 and 98 uh, public law that was passed by Congress, which is uh, Public Law 1134, there's uh, two conditions which you can start a fire, the destruction of public and private property or of life, period. There's nothing else we could to drive than that. So if there is a public law that was created by Congress and passed by Congress, then what the hell are we doing? Meaning any citizen <laughs> can start a backfire under those two conditions. Right. Gentlemen, I would like to offer a solution to all of this uh, corruption that we're dealing with in these court systems. And I believe that that would be to put an antitrust lawsuit against the Bar Association uh, for violation of the Robertson-Patman Act which outlaws any monopoly in any state. Basically, it, if we did an antitrust lawsuit against the bar and separated the bar from the state, it would make it so any person that has law knowledge can go in and defend anybody in the court. And if we could do that, uh, we would be able to change the game. But as it is right now, it's the just-us system. And we have to get this open. We have to do this antitrust lawsuit because they're basically outlawing all the mom-and-pop stores. That's all it is. Yes, they they, are. Are, they, they are. do not want any competition. I offer a better service than most of these guys because they only win two cases in a lifetime. I've won 102 of them. I mean, that's ridiculous. I've done better than what? That's why I say we, we can certainly use some assistance from you here in Las Vegas because they are definitely being predatory and rapacious and horrifically abusive to the people here. I mean, the crap that goes on here is just unbelievable. I, oh yeah, I, and like I, I tell I everybody, to, I have to, I have to agree with you there, Chris. I saw that when I was there. It's insane. We have a caller on the line, Rand in Virginia. Rand, go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yes, Rand, go ahead. You're on. Hi. I, I'm just listening on the uh, internet, and I thought I would call in. Uh, maybe I could offer some perspective. Um, I, if I could just listen for a little while, I'd appreciate it. I'll just chime yeah. in. That's fine. You have anything to add? Well, uh, I was listening to the gentleman talking about um, uh, his troubles in the federal court system, and uh, uh, I, I, I myself have uh, extensive experience in the federal courts. And uh, the, uh, the the trick in the federal court system when you're filing 1983s, habeas corpuses, or uh, uh, ADA, EEOC type complaints is is the procedure it's a, it's a slippery slope and if you don't understand um, uh, how they treat pro se individuals or people that are bringing their own actions versus attorney representative represented actions you're gonna um you're, you're not gonna fare too well because they they uh, this, the, the cards are definitely stacked against those that are not represented so it's that much more important to understand the federal rules of civil procedure. So when he was talking about uh, the, the 12B6, uh, he was having problems getting through the 12B6. I don't remember the gentleman's name. And that's basically the, 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 the dismissal because you haven't, you haven't stated a claim. Um, uh, what they do is they, they turn that into a, only against pro se individuals, they turn the 12B6 into a motion for summary judgment. And then they kick yeah. your case and you're out immediately without yeah. a, twi a, twi without a 26 f without a 26 f conference and no discovery. So it's that exactly. much important. Due process denial. 
Right, and and that's when when Jeremy was talking about the affidavits, the affidavits of status aren't that important in federal court, uh, contrary to what you may believe. But you, you have to you have to have more than a scintilla of evidence behind your facts. And another thing is, if you don't understand your causes of action, they're specific. They fr- the way you frame your facts can mess up your affidavit. So it, it, it's a slippery slope. If you don't understand the causes of action. And, and the elements that go to proving the cause of action, your, 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 your affidavits will be defective, and then they'll kick your case. And we don't, as a, as, a, as a non-attorney, we don't know that. It takes a long time to figure it out. You have to reverse engineer this crap. And I've been doing it for, I'm actually a federal, I'm actually a federal law clerk, so I, I fully Good, get Grant. what you're saying, and I understand the frustration. Excellent. Grant, if you don't mind, let me share something with all of you here. There's a case or at least a treatise called The Rise of the Common Law of Federal Pleadings, Iqbal and Twombly, and the Application of Judicial Experience by Henry S. Noyes from Villanova Law. And it's a a very insightful treatise, and it shows how the judges have perverted and twisted and manufactured theories that are not in the case, and one of the words is actually used in the case one time. The other one's not used at all, yet they have perverted the law twisted the word and invented the uh, theory that it's in there, and it's not. And that's where they well, come with that 12B6 to dismissal you. Well, well, the, the, the Iqbal Twombly pleading or, or the, the standard is what that is, is basically you have to, you have to plead with specificity. If you can't yes. plead your cause of action with specificity, you can't just make a general allegation and get your case to a, to the to the jury box. It's not going to happen. You have to plead you want, specific facts. If you wanted to communicate, for, Grant, I would be thrilled to have uh, to share knowledge with you and Jeremy. Also, uh, this is this is this cabal of black robe terrorists is what we're all but, fighting against, and they have this subjective interpretive scale that they can proportionally bias. Ad infinitum from low to high I, 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 I hear, discriminate. <laughs> I hear what you're yeah. saying. I, I have I have uh, uh, several reversals at the appellate level that I that I've done the the the, the appellate work on. I fully get what you're saying. I understand the frustration. There, there's if you want to play in this in this sandbox, you have to play by the rules. And I I know there's all the people out there that say you know I'm. I'm the, the what is it, the man on the dry land, and uh, you know I, I you don't have jurisdiction over me. As soon as you walk into that courtroom, if you if you get beat by your jurisdictional argument, your personal jurisdictional argument, you better be ready to play by the rules because they're going to ram it down your throat if you're not. Yeah, I mean I've, I've done. The, Jeremy says he's got 102 cases. I'm well over that in the federal court system. And uh, um, I, I, uh, I can say that, that I've, I've had my, I've gone through my own lumps and bruises, and, and playing with these these characters. And uh, uh, I just, I just, I just went ahead and just learned the rules better than them. And uh, and I've had significant success doing that. So if you can get that, I want you to do me a favor. Please leave your information with my producer, your email, and your contact information. We've run out of time, uh, and I want to be able to reach out to you and, and have a further dialogue with you. So if you would, please do me that favor by leaving your contact information with my producer. Folks, we've run to the end of our time. Resurrect the Republic Truth Radio broadcast on the Republic Broadcasting Network. Thank you for tuning in with us. And Laz, thank you. Your guests, thank you. And, and the callers have been amazing tonight. And we want to pick this up where we left off tomorrow. Resurrect the Republic, Truth Radio Broadcast on RB.